And so I'm going to jump right in. I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute. Uh, thank you all for being here. I hope you're all holding up through what is such a sort of social, intellectual, physical ordeal to do all the things that we, uh, we, we present to you over these days. Um, but, but, you know, we are really excited about, about uh, uh, this topic uh, we have this morning. Uh, we, we call this the age of Euroscepticism. And I think, you know, when, when we think about Europe, uh, so much of Europe, in my opinion, is arguably at the apogee of human political and social development. Uh, you know, many of the countries of Europe, arguably, with the highest standard of, of living, high GNP, extraordinary social uh, uh, safety nets, and, and then you consider what earlier 20th century was, was like, you know, with two devastating world wars, this development that has been so extraordinary, so positive for the people of Europe, so positive as an inspiration for the world, is now for various reasons coming into question uh, by, by many. Yet again, we have to remember just how remarkable it is. You know, enemies in world wars working together, even sharing governance systems, sharing currencies, and now there are various signs uh, that leave some to be concerned. And indeed, the threats if you look just a decade ago or even several years ago, some of the things that we've seen might have been unimaginable. I mean, of course, there was the, you know, the Euro crisis, North-South divide, core periphery kind of divides. Just last year, many discussions at the Ideas Festival related to the shock, and it was such a shock, of Brexit, uh, terrorism on European soil, uh, the implications of the Syrian war with floods of refugees, and the Im impact of that on European social cohesion. Also, various failed states in Africa. And as they go north, uh, they, they all want to go to Europe. And then, of course, recent e examples of illiberal governments. You look at what's happening uh, in, in Hungary. It's extraordinary. Uh, Poland in, in similar directions. Uh, many other countries. Uh, the, the rise of extremist parties, and not just in the peripheries of Europe, uh, but even something like the alternative uh, for Germany uh, in Germany. And then, of course, you look at, at, at the Turkish election just Sunday. Of course, a NATO member, and as we had someone at the last session of the festival say, essentially what we witnessed on Sunday, Sunday was an electoral dictatorship, essentially the people of a country voting for what is almost now a dictatorship. And finally, we have the uh, clearly anti-European, anti-NATO uh, um, rhetoric from uh, and attitudes of this administration. Uh, indeed, just this morning, there was an article in the Washington Post uh, suggesting that President Trump, having discovered how many troops we have in Germany and how expensive they are, asking the Pentagon to do some analysis that might lead to repositioning of our troops in Germany or reducing them. And of course, that, needless to say, is concerning our allies considerably. So to discuss these and similar issues, we've assembled a terrific panel. Uh, Mircea Joana, uh, the former president of the Romanian Senate, uh, former president of the Romanian Social Democratic Party, uh, candidate for president, uh, long story, he was actually president for a few hours, but then they brought in some absentee ballots. <laughs> life, uh, life is tough. <laughs> we all have experienced things like that too. Uh, uh, for, uh, uh, and he'd been the ambassador to the United States, former foreign minister, might be a presidential candidate again, although while that might be great for Romania and the Europe, uh, we would be concerned about here at this at Aspen because he's also the founder and chairman of really one of our most vibrant and successful overseas Aspen institutes in Aspen, Romania. Uh, to my far left, uh, Douglas Lute, uh, president of Cambridge Global Advisors. That's not Cambridge Analytica. Uh, 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 <laughs> chair of uh, social sciences at West Point. Uh, also a, uh, a professor, a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, and of course, we all know him as, as uh, our ambassador to NATO from 2013 to 2017, uh, and then an enormously distinguished 
uh, a nonpartisan career uh, in the National Security Councils of both President Obama and President Bush, and before that, a very distinguished military career, uh, uh, culminating as Lieutenant General and Director of Operations for the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff. And in the middle, uh, Kati Martan, a uh, prolific and best-selling writer, journalist, uh, human uh, rights advocate. Uh, she's written nine books. Her tenth, uh, very germane to what we're talking about today, will be a bi biography of Angela Merkel. And you've undoubtedly seen her many times on television, heard her on the radio, and seen her publications in just about every leading publishing publish, cu publication in the country. And she's also been extremely active as a trustee and board member in many extraordinary causes, especially relating to human rights, women's rights, and the rights of children. So where to begin? Kati, if I may, let me begin with you. Um, being familiar with what you've written, you have been an enormously strong advocate as for the EU as an essential bulwark against nationalism. The risks in Europe uh, for, uh, with respect to nationalism are evident, even going back only recently with the Balkan War. So just tell us, how important does the EU remain, in your opinion, and how worried we sh should we be about its current challenges? Well, thank you, Elliot. And before I, I attempt to tackle that extremely uh, urgent question, uh, let me just say what a, what a pleasure and an honor it is for me to be with you uh, at the Aspen Ideas Festival. It's my first time here, and uh, you give me, all of you, give me uh, great hope uh, about our future because there's so much civic activism and civic uh, responsibility that I'm, that I'm uh, picking up from my conversations with all of you. Uh, so this is, of course, where, where change must come. And of course, to be sharing a podium with these two distinguished gentlemen is, is a singular honor for me. Uh, so um, now to, uh, to Elliot's question about, uh, I, I am not a Eurosceptic. I think that, uh, that, that Europe in, in uh, um, alliance with the United States is the absolute linchpin uh, of, of our peaceful and prosperous existence. Without that transatlantic alliance thriving, what is the United States but an island floating between the Atlantic and the Pacific? And what is Europe without the United States uh, backing it up but an extension of, uh, of Eurasia? And the, the astonishment that, is, that the fact that uh, Europe's future is now uh, in, in jeopardy from the very country, the United States, that set up the post-war order and uh, took from the, the ash heap of, of uh, the devastation of, of Nazism, a built, built the, the um, construct which has preserved peace for 70 years, and that, that now we are, we, that is to say, the Trump administration, um, are, uh, are undermining that is, is, uh, is more, than, more than I, as a uh, Hungarian, frankly, can, uh, can, can really wrap my mind around. But, but, um, but the game is not over. We have a big role to play, but we mustn't resign ourselves to the fact that, that well, there goes, there goes Europe, and here come the demagogues and the populists ascended. We have options. We have measures that we can take, and I don't want to use up uh, all the oxygen on this, on this panel of, of, of wisdom, um, and I have very specific recommendations. Uh, as to as to what we can do, but let me just uh, conclude my opening statement by by saying that uh, that Europe ain't old world. It's it's absolutely essential for us, and we just have to do a better job of telling the story of why Europe is not a bunch of of uh, bureaucrats in Brussels uh, making stupid rules and regulations, but in fact there is. Uh, an important narrative that, that knits European civilization and American civilization together, and that has to be preserved. 
Well, thank you, and we'll get back to many of those things. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Ambassador. And we will um, also hope that we can end on as optimistic a note on, on, on these kind of topics, and also get back to you with you know with your own insights as a Hungarian about uh, Mr. Orban and what. Oh, is I've got plenty there. to say on that. <laughs> so, 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 Doug, let, I, I mentioned President Trump's attitudes, apparent <laughs> attitudes toward the European Union and NATO, and it seems, and then we saw his performance at the G7, uh, he seems to think that these institutions underdeliver, that they cheat their members, and that they are very bad investments for the United States. Is he right? And if not, why is he wrong? And what are the counter arguments? Well, look, I, I grew up in the US military. And when the US military thinks about doing anything around the world, there are basically two strategic options. Do it alone, and if you look around the world today, that's not such an attractive option. Or you can do it as part of uh, a coalition or part of a NATO uh, alliance-based uh, operation. And so one of our greatest strategic advantages over any near-peer competitor, think of China or Russia, for example, right, is this constellation of alliances that we have in Europe centered on NATO, but also the constellation in, uh, in East Asia, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. There's never in world history been such a strategic advantage uh, enjoyed by one power. So for us to question this is, to me, simply, you know, it's, it's not understandable. From a military national security perspective, this is bedrock for us. And so to, to throw stones at it, to fracture it, to be disruptive uh, in this core uh, important uh, advantage makes no strategic sense at all. So yes, it's worth it, and we should be doing exactly the opposite, which is investing in the welfare, the health, the vibrancy of these organizations. So, let me just follow up on, on one, one thing, Doug. What about NATO spending? I mean, President Trump mm -hmm. keeps coming back right. to that. So look, let's what, get to what the are the facts? So first of all, you know, the administration is a little behind in its reading, OK? It, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't understand this. NATO has two basic forms of funding. There's operational funding, uh, and that's proportioned out uh, in a set proportion. The US share is 22% of this common funding. This runs the headquarters building, pays the staff, and so forth. It's about $2 billion a year. It's not that much in big, in, you know, big organizational terms. All the rest of NATO funding is national funding. So when he talks about someone over, uh, you know, underpaying or owing money to NATO, he fundamentally doesn't understand that if the Germans are not making a target of their defense spending, it's Germany underinvesting in Germany. Now, um, it, he has an element of truth here. And most uh, overstatements, right, there's a sort of an undercurrent of truth. And that is that some of our European allies are underperforming. But this is not news. Okay, this is, uh, my wife has a famous saying, it's, she calls it the Christopher Columbus saying, which is confusing what's new to what's new to you. Okay? So, so, so she has a lot of these sayings. It always keeps, but, but this is a little Christopher Columbus-like, right? This is, this is not new to this administration. I mean, a whole series of Democrat and Republican administrations in the past have called for our NATO allies to do more. What is new, and this is a change over the last 20 years, is that over the last four years, NATO has seen four successive years of real increases in defense spending among allies other than the US, right? And if you add up that four years of progress, it's, a, it's an increase of $87 billion committed by our NATO allies. That's real money. Even in defense budgets, $87 billion is real money. So the good news is we have turned the corner um, uh, the unfortunate thing is that there's a lot of misinformation out there about defense spending. Um, and I also think it's unfortunate that one administration or another is taking credit here. The individual most responsible for this upswing in NATO defense spending, his first name is Vladimir. Okay, his last name is Putin. Um, it wasn't Bush, it wasn't Obama, and it certainly wasn't Trump who convinced, persuaded, cajoled, or threatened our NATO allies 
that resulted in this increased defense spending. It's, it's the aggressive actions of Putin on NATO's periphery. I think can I just, jump, can in, I just yeah. jump in? This will probably be my, my one and only supportive statement about President Trump, um, so I don't want to miss the opportunity. <laughs> um, it, it, he's he, he's on to something when he says that, that um, our NATO allies are not pulling their weight when it comes to defense spending. And one of the, um, you, you, will, you will gather that I'm a, a hopeless optimist, one of the silver linings of, of this current crisis is that it's, it's given uh, the, the, uh, our Western allies a real shock to the system, and they are now increasing defense spending. Even the most reluctant of them all, Germany, because given, given its own particular history, the, the Germans are, are very uh, uh, reluctant to, to uh, beef up their military, which, which badly needs shoring up, but they are doing it now. So thanks to Donald Trump. <laughs> Romania and, spends 2% of, uh, of GDP for defense, but this doesn't mean that I'm very worried. Well, let, about, let me about what's going on. Well, let me let me ask you to expand on that, Mircea. Mer you, you know, you've been a, a, a prominent, you know, a, a, a Europeanist, and you played a re leading role in bringing Romania out of communism and desperation into the de in, into into Europe and and democracy. Uh, so, how how do you explain the, the apparent rise of illiberalism? In, in so many countries around you? And what do you think it will take to create a new European narrative again? Thank you, Elliot, and thank uh, each of every one of you for taking the time to be with us. Um, I think for our American audience, one should always look at Europe as the place for political experimentation, for good and bad. And all these isms, fascism, communism, anti-Semitism, all these things were bred and fomented and came to the rise, creating huge devastation for the world from Europe. The same Europe, because of the tough lessons of history, tried only a few decades ago, in 1957, in Rome, European communities were created. And European Union today, the successor of European economic communities, is the most interesting political experimentation for the good this time around. So this is the contrast. And for our American friends, and I think for people all over the world who are interested in democracy and, 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 and free societies, I think one should look at Europe as the terrain of experimentation. I'm not only... Uh, I was president for one night in my country, which is an unforgettable unfor <laughs> experience. <laughs> but I was also one referendum away to become a founding father of Europe. Because to give you an historical example, and I think this is the moment when things started to unravel in Europe. In 2004, as foreign minister of my country, I signed again in Rome, together with other leaders from Europe, the European Constitution. European Constitution. And for America, and all discussions about the Supreme Court and the Constitution and everything else, you can realize what stage of political integration Europe would have gone to if the European Constitution would have been approved. We signed it. Each of the EU countries signed this, presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers. And only one year after, in 2005, in France and in the Netherlands, referendum to approve the European Constitution were turned down by the French public, by 55% of the public, with 63% participation rate, and 62% in the Netherlands with something like 68 participation rate. So that moment when the ones who created the euro on January 1st, 1999, the euro, another big invention, 20-something sovereign nations to put together their currency, to put together their sovereignty, to put things together. This is something which is unprecedented in human history. So this precious experiment is now under siege. And other ugly isms are coming back from the furnace and from the, 
disaster that Europe has created in the previous decades and centuries. Ethnic nationalism is back. This is one of the most dangerous things that is resurfacing in our part of Europe, including in countries in our region. We thought that ethnic nationalism is something that Europe would have addressed. Then you have, of course, populism. This is something which is also not new uh, around the world, and America is not immune to that phenomenon as well. And we have also another, uh, another temptation that we see in the Western democratic world, which is authoritarianism. A long and difficult word, but it, which is such, such an ugly meaning behind it. So what we see today in Europe, to, to, to give a relatively short answer to a very complicated question, we see some old things from the past resurfacing in new sub-variants. The ugly ghosts of Europe are coming back. In which format, we still don't know. And this is sort of an epic struggle for the heart and soul of the European project. And my last point about this for an American audience, this is not only what, what, uh, uh, what the ambassador uh, and my dear friend, or what Carty Martin was saying before about alliances, about these kind of things. If Europe goes astray, God forbid, as a Romanian, this would be the worst nightmare in our history. Because finally, we are part of the Western family of democracies, NATO, EU. We are a country which is coming from behind, from a very difficult, harsh communist legacy. And I see my West, my West, our West, unraveling. So I'm also telling our American friends, if Europe cannot, because of internal and also exogenous, external uh, uh, reasons, play our global role, the whole global balance of power will change also to the detriment of America. This is not only Europe having the risk of going down the tubes and returning to fragmentation and uh, centrifugal tendencies and hatred and tension and nationalism. But also America will suffer, not only in terms of alliances, but also in terms of the fight against a counter proposition which is coming both from China and Russia that propose a different model of organizing a society. So for the, you know, uh, the ones who are really care about America and your system of democratic uh, behavior, irrespective of the current leaders, Europe is a place to watch. Europe is a place to harness. Europe is a place to continue to invest to, even if it's sometimes difficult uh, with so many countries and so many leaders. So I'm, I, I, this is a cry of deep concern from someone who has basically dreamed not only of a united Europe, but also of a strong transatlantic uh, community of democracies and like-minded nations. So I'm not... Still a desperado, speaking of the France-Argentina game, I'm not yet a desperado, um, but I'm very concerned. And I think the topic, Elliot, that you have chosen and the Ideas Festival has chosen for our, uh, for our conference is just uh, very timely and very serious and very deep. So, so Doug wants to so, jump so in. Let me just question, jump right? in on this point, because this, this is fundamental for American audiences. Mm. You know, some of us have, some of us here in America are so removed from this that we fall into this narrative trap that somehow we're the good guys and we're just giving a gift to Europe. Europe doesn't appreciate it. They freeload on us. They take advantage of us. We end up feeling cheated. That is a false narrative. We should, we should fight back against that. This is not altruism. This is in our interest. This is in our strategic interest. It's good news that Europe is moving closer to whole free and at peace, which is the image, right? But, but it's not just because we're good guys. It's because it's been fundamentally for 70 years in our interest to have like-minded trading partners, political partners, and military allies at our side. So this is a very self-interested approach to the transatlantic relationship. And, and Katty, let's just stay on this for a minute and, and, and Mircha's description. Tell us, in your view, a little bit more of the ideology of this, how we got to this point. You remain optimistic. You know, either generally, you know, where this illiberalism and, and these other things that we see have come from, and if you want to sp speak specifically about Hungary, you said you're an optimist. 
Mm. Are you optimistic about Hungary too? Well, I don't think we have any choice. I think we have to be optimists because um, if we if we sink into doom and gloom, then game is over. So, and we have agency. We are still in possession, each and every one of us, of platforms and voices. And uh, but but we can't we can't be passive, and we can't just feel that voting every few years is is a sufficient show of good citizenship because it clearly isn't. I think that that uh, the rise of populism um, on both sides of the Atlantic um, was was um, mis misread and uh, and missed on on uh, by the rulers on both sides. The EU. Uh, as much as us uh, uh, liberal and full disclosure Democrats, uh, I, I, I am, ever since I, became, I took the, the, the pledge to, uh, be, uh, to, uh, to be a naturalized American, I, I, um, I've been a Democrat. Um, but it, the, the, the fact is that, that uh, populism was just there under the surface, and we missed we missed the early warning signs. We missed um, the fact that identity seems to trump, if you'll pardon the expression, um, national identity. That that you know, primal, primal tribal identity, if I can call it that, uh, never went away. And the EU missed that in in trying to knit together and and as as. Um, I don't know whether to call you Mr. President, Mr. Foreign Minister, or, or Mr. Ambassador. Mr. President. Mr. President. Okay. Okay. Is my, my wife and my daughter here. Okay. Uh, they, don't, they don't call him Mr. President. I, can I say hope that. not. Only uh, around the only house. We hoped. Uh, to okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Mircha, he, yeah. do this. Mircha, do that. <laughs> okay, Mircha. Okay. Um, so the, 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 the uh, European Union has allowed itself to be caricatured by the likes of Erdogan and Orban and Kaczynski, and by the way, all of them benefiting uh, hugely from the largesse of the EU. Uh, I know that, that my former homeland of Hungary has rebuilt itself uh, into the beautiful country that many of you have, who have traveled there see um, because of uh, EU funding, and yet the EU has become the new enemy um, and and that's just that's just crazy. The EU has to do a better job of telling its own story. The only time I see people uh, feeling European uh, is is when the Ode to Joy, the anthem of the EU, is played. So it, there has to be more uh, attempt to knit together. We share the values of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and the enormous cultural uh, explosion that took place before it was snuffed out by by. Uh, uh, World War One and Two. All three of us sitting here uh, it, were, in some way, uh, involved in the Balkan Wars, and so we know how fast hate can spread, and how fast a gifted demagogue, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, was such, as is Viktor Orban. Uh, how fast such a, uh, a skilled manipulator of of public opinion, and and I give. Um, uh, Donald Trump full marks for being skilled at reading a crowd and playing to it uh, can can appeal to uh, our um, our worst instincts. So we have to be alert. These these seventy years of peace and prosperity have lulled us into thinking it was forever. But it, now it seems to be it was a time out of history, and and that now we are reverting um, to uh, to to pre. Uh, pre-EU, pre-NATO, uh, pre the construct that, uh, that we're busy, busy undermining. And, uh, and we have to push back against that. I keep asking myself what, what it was that my Hungarian grandparents who perished in the Holocaust, what did they not do in the 30s when the clouds were gathering? And, and so what should I, what should we be doing now to, um, to not just sit back and uh, and assume, well, we're we're Americans, we're we're safe, because the distance uh, between between um, Moscow and um, and Berlin is very 
very short, and it isn't going to be, and, and, and I'll let Doug hold forth on that, it's not going to come from tanks and battalions. Putin doesn't need to fire a shot. Uh, he's winning without that via cyber warfare. And, and we haven't even officially at the highest level acknowledged that fact. So, you know, there's a lot of, it's all happening very fast. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that Richard Holbrook isn't here. Doug, let me, let me just ask a, 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 a specific question about the EU. Um, there are provisions for policing against anti-democratic developments. They don't seem to be working or they're not being engaged. Uh, why have they been ineffective? And, and what do you think can be done by the EU as they see these illiberal developments in various of its members? So as the NATO guy up here, I'm probably least uh, well equipped here, but as I understand it, the, the EU treaty actually has provisions for policing, for internal policing, right? And as EU members, when they sign up for the treaty, they agree that if they begin to slip or drift away from the founding values embedded in the treaty, that the organization can come back and impose sanctions and penalties. And this has been most recently in the news with regard to um, the judicial, the moves against the Polish judiciary, uh, keeping the, the, the court system in Poland free and independent from outside political influence. And while the EU, and here I stand ready to hear from my colleagues, while the EU has threatened or has talked about imposing these sanctions to sort of bring Poland back online, they have not yet taken that step. And the, and the sanctions include things like cutting off or diminishing the funding mm -hmm. that comes from the EU and goes out to the member states. So it's a real, real potential anyway to sanction and bring these countries back in line. But it's actually a very fair question. Where do we think we stand on that? And why hasn't the commission actually taken this step. And, and I'll actually ask the others to comment on that, but before I do, you said you're the NATO guy. NATO doesn't have such provisions. It is does. That, it's, it, it in does? the treaty, yes. Are there things NATO can be the doing? The Washington Treaty is also in one of the articles speaking that we are a community of democracies, rule of law. Uh, so both the EU and NATO have somewhere so, right. into so, the So let's talk. I just happen to have a copy of the North Atlantic Treaty. <laughs> Just by chance. It's a, it happened to be in my jacket, sorry. I mean, who, so, who uh, doesn't? Yeah, who does it, right? <laughs> and so, so Mirsha was right. The second sentence of what is called the Washington Treaty, because it was signed here in Washington in 1949, right? Uh, the second sentence says that everybody who signs up for this uh, agrees with the principles of three values, democracy, individual liberty, and rule of law. Those same three values are held in common with the EU Treaty. Exactly. So, so the, comp, the bedrock here is not number of members and all that sort of thing, right? It's these values. And it's, to Kati and Marshall's point, it's these values today that seem to be slipping. And that's why this is fundamentally different. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier a few reasons why America and the American public and the American um, people that are concerned about the future of your nation, which is normal, should look into, room, into what happens in Europe with even greater interest than usual. Because also in Europe, like in America, and most of the Western societies, in the few years um, after the big economic crisis, we had a Eurozone crisis in Europe. You remember Greece and uh, Syriza and that first uh, left-wing radical populist movement showing up. Not a big difference from what Bernie Sanders was saying and what the guys from Greece were saying. And I say this with absolutely at face value. This is not a political consideration. It's just the fact that also in Europe, some structural trends are eroding this very foundation that we thought is basic, basically um, there to last forever. It doesn't last forever. Nothing lasts forever when conditions change. And in Europe, we see trends of social, economic, and cultural dislocations of significant scale, amplified by this economic financial crisis, but a huge dislike. And this is where I think 
European citizens and American citizens are right, a feeling of almost hatred against national and supranational elites, which people do consider the ones who are losing from globalization, from the disappearance of manufacturing jobs, of the ones who are feel besieged as a collective community. And people in Europe are saying that national governments are not doing their job, which many times is true, but also supranational, like Eurocrats, people in Brussels, distant technocrats that are dictating and imposing on our lives. So these trends are there too, as they are in America. And the third dimension that uh, Cardi was referring to is the fantastic shrewdness in which Russia is playing a very weak hand. Russia has a GDP of the level of Spain. Spain is a great country, but there are only 40 million. It's a country we love and has problems also from, from the Catalan thing, so there are also centrifugal tendencies. So what we see now, especially in Central Eastern Europe, um, a fantastic propaganda machine financed and fueled by Russian propaganda, and basically also in, in Hungary and in Poland, they are basically using the sense of aggression that what we call the ethno national majorities in our countries, they feel threatened by all these things about family, sexual orientation, the role of the church, the role of faith. So these kind of things are also playing uh, uh, their part into this Eurosceptic uh, mood uh, in, in Europe. So a camp for experimentation in Europe, yes, watch out because all these things are also present in your society. And we are in this together. And if we don't realize we are in this together, we'll start to get atomized, we'll start to play alone, and this is the worst nightmare that a Romanian or a Pole or a French, ah, by the way, France. Um, Macron is one of the few, let's say, more vital leaders that we have today in Europe. Chancellor Merkel is weakened after three terms, beginning of the fourth in Germany, uh, problems at the coalition. President Trump is taking upon her personally for political and economic reasons. And giving another and the last historical reference, 99 years ago, on June 28th, near Paris in Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, sealing the faith of Germany, basically. At the end of the First World War, the couple of Trianon did with Romania, Hungary was unhappy, Romania was very happy. I mean, this was the new order in Europe after the First World War. The Versailles Treaty was basically about how to neutralize the potential rise of a strong European core center. And I'm afraid that this issue is also today present, and the attempt to dislocate the French-German couple as the engine of Europe is an active policy in some corners, and the risk of having multiple cores and multiple peripheries in Europe is another centrifugal risk that I, I perceive, and the Aspen Institute in Romania and Europe, we're trying to do something about that. So, um, Kachi, and because, then, I, because, then I'm going to have a question for Doug, and then okay. I'm going to open it up to everybody. Okay, um, you've done a, a, a brilliant and devastating job of, of, of laying out um, the crisis that we're in and asserting uh, the problems in all their complexity. Um, I do not wish to send all of you wonderful people out into the Aspen sunshine um, looking to slit your wrists. So let me just say, <laughs> let me just say that uh, as I am deeply uh, involved in what's going on in, uh, in Germany as I'm writing um, Merkel's biography, that the, that the German, that the Franco-German alliance uh, is stronger than ever, and, and that is the linchpin of Europe. Europe is not, with all due respect, if there are any people here from Liechtenstein or Luxembourg, Europe is, is at its core, the, um, the Franco-German alliance, and from there it radiates outward. And the French did not elect uh, Le Pen. 
Um, the, yes, the Alternative for Deutschland is in the Bundestag, but it has only 12 or 13 percent support, which is much less than what uh, the Front National has in, in France. Um, and Merkel is an extraordinarily skilled, masterful, I would say, politician who is always underrated, and hence her 13 years of holding the most powerful position in Europe, and she's a woman, may I say, um, and, and has managed not to make that the issue, uh, which is also a feat of brilliance. So she has just, um, in the last 24 hours, uh, yet again escaped a near-death experience. She won the support of 14 members of the European Union for, for uh, uh, a coherent migration policy, which is what was threatening her, um, her, her coalition. Um, so there is, um, there, there is a European core, um, and she has obviously the, the, the support of, uh, of, the, of the Netherlands. And OK, Brexit was a, was a huge blow. But, uh, but the British are not going away. It'll take years for that divorce uh, to kick in. And uh, so I, I, uh, I have great faith in, in Merkel as a leader um, and, and Merkel's ability to, to build on what she just gained yesterday. And the, the, the key thing is migration. By the way, there is no migration crisis. That happened two summers ago when she very generously uh, opened her borders and said, wir schaffen das, we can handle this. And it was, a, it was a spectacularly humanitarian gesture, but entirely out of character for Merkel. Well, there's no immigration crisis in this country either. There's no immigration so, crisis in, so, in, in Europe. So, so before we turn it to the audience, Doug, there, there are two summits coming up, and I'd right. like your comments right. on so, each. <laughs> One, the NATO summit, and right. whether that could come off the tracks like the G7. So the G7 went well. Well, <laughs> okay. Okay. yeah. And, and, and then, of course, the summit with Mr. Putin, and right. what in the world is going on there? Right, so this may seem like we're at the Aspen Ideas Festival, right? But in less than two weeks, this same topic is gonna to play out internationally, because President Trump's gonna arrive at NATO headquarters for a summit. Uh, he'll join his 28 uh, colleagues to include Angela Merkel, Macron, Trudeau, fresh from the G7 experience. So this is really going to be, this is going to be high, <laughs> high adventure. Yeah, this is going to be great. Okay, uh, all my NATO friends and uh, partners are all, you know, sitting on pins and needles, wondering how this is going to work out. I think the important thing there, there's really only one deliverable for any time that the NATO leaders get together at the president, prime minister level. Right? There's only one. And they'll do a lot of business. They'll do talk about command structures and readiness and all that, right? But the one thing they have to deliver is unity. Uh, and that's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the president being not a unifying, uniting influence among these 29, but a disruptive influence. Um, I think that when the president enters NATO headquarters, you know, he'll, the big sedan will drop him off. He has a short walk, about 50 meters. He will, he needs to look to his right as he walks into NATO headquarters because to his right is a large piece of twisted metal mounted on a small podium. And it's called the Article 5 Memorial. And it's called that because on September 12th, 2001, less than 24 hours after the attacks in Washington and New York and Pennsylvania, the NATO alliance for the first and only time in its history, this is the only time this has ever happened in world history, voted to side with the United States and invoke what's called Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, right? And this is the all for one, one for all article, right? So when we were at our most needy point, when we didn't know what was going on, when the airspace above America was shut because of this unexpected, most deadly attack ever on American homeland, who stood up? Who was at our side? So my advice to him is glance to your right and look at the Article 5 memorial as you walk into NATO headquarters, and that's everything you need to be briefed on. 
with regard to NATO. When we needed them, they were there for us. Uh, and someday, one of them is going to need us, or perhaps we're going to need them again. And that's what alliances are all about. Now, the second big event following, if that weren't enough, right? Um, several days after NATO, he's going to first go to the UK, which could also be high adventure. So that, so watch your screens on that. But then uh, I think on the 15th or 16th, 16th of July now, he'll meet uh, President Putin in Helsinki. Um, and I think the challenge there will be, uh, first of all, it's very good that he's going to see NATO first. Uh, so that he is seen to have had an opportunity to hear from his NATO allies about how NATO approaches its relationship with Russia, its largest, most militarily capable neighbor, right? So the geography still counts here. Russia is still NATO's neighbor. Um, and NATO has a very balanced approach with regard to Russia. It is essentially, look, Putin, if you're going to tear up the rule book from the UN Charter through the Helsinki Final Act, through the NATO-Russia Founding Act, if all that is thrown out with your seizing of Ukrainian territory, the Crimean Peninsula, and the destabilizing of Eastern Ukraine, okay, then we're gonna take countermeasures. We're gonna do what we need to do to be strong here in Europe. But we're also gonna be mature enough, as an alliance, to keep the door open for dialogue. So it's a two-part approach, strength and dialogue. That should be the basic approach that the U.S. reflects when it meets with Putin. Now, who knows what's going to happen there, um, but if he goes in with a strength and dialogue balanced approach, we'll be just fine, and, and that's what I'm hopeful for. Okay, we're going to have just a few minutes for questions. Uh, Sam, there's a, a question right here in the second row. From your perspective, how dangerous, number one, is it for Trump to meet alone with Putin, just the Russian interpreter? And from your perspective, why do you think Trump is so cozy with Putin? Does Putin have something really big over Trump from your perspective? So, and the refusal so to accept you, the uh, well, well, so, electoral um, interference. The, the well, Comey presentation is elsewhere here right? <laughs> <laughs> on, on campus. Yeah, but we, we have strong views on that, and it's a great couple of questions. And obviously, it's, it's dangerous to leave these two alone. Um, however, um, as to, as to yeah, and, and, and just as obviously, he has an affinity, our president does, for autocratic authoritarian personalities. Um, and and uh, it's, it's odd to have, um, as, our, as our president, someone who has so little uh, knowledge of history uh, and so little regard for the rule of law, but but we elected him uh, by a very tiny margin. But that means that we can unelect him too. So uh, let me let me just repeat my mantra that we have agency, and uh, you know we're not just uh, passively sitting by here. Uh, on on on. The but if I may, uh, so yes. just on the one-on-one -on -one thing, there's a very yeah. practical reason that you don't. Do, I mean, look, there are probably business leaders here in the audience or civic leaders in the audience. It's always good to have another set of eyes and ears on what was actually yeah. said. Otherwise, a one-on-one -on -one meeting can mean, after the meeting is dismissed, two completely 180 degree different versions of, of reality. Uh, and that's not positive. It, it, it gives Putin the latitude right, to make up his own story about what President Trump said. And then we're in a defensive position. So this is, it is political, it is personal, but it's also practical. This is just good yeah. business. I'm, 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 I'm less concerned because there are other questions about uh, if there'll be one 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 two or two or whatever kind of format. Um, I'm concerned, uh, number one, by the location, because uh, the, the Trump team, not only the president, but Trump team have chosen Helsinki because of his historical meaning in 1975 in Helsinki, um, the, uh, co the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe, CSE at that time, I chaired this organization in 2001, OSCE, was formed. So the big detente uh, between Soviet Union and the West. And I think what the concern is, uh, there's not a problem to engage Russia in a constructive way. Right. No. But it's one thing to cave in to, to Russia's aggressive stance and to give up on, on uh, your own allies. So that's the concern we have, that Helsinki is not only about the choreography, which is important, but also by the real aim and the end result of this meeting. This is something that we are watching in Romania, in Poland, in the Baltic countries, 
with binoculars uh, uh, over the, the, well, the I mean, Baltic what could Center. be more ironic that in, uh, in 1975, the Helsinki Final Act yeah. is, is uh, inaugurated there. And you know, if you read just the first section of the Helsinki Final Act, it talks about territorial integrity, respect for the rule of law, um, and, yeah. and respect for sovereignty. And that's where our president's going to meet with the guy who broke all those rules uh, in Ukraine. So I mean, this is the ultimate irony for Helsinki. But as to your final question about what does Russia have, I think uh, on, on, uh, on Trump, I think that that's one reason why, why um, the Mueller investigation has to be allowed to, to draw its conclusions. And, and that's another thing that we as citizens can do to safeguard that that, that is not uh, jeopardized. But even before Mueller, Mueller, whatever happens there, that will, you know, look, the American justice system will play its way out. Mm -hmm. So I have, we have to have confidence in that yeah. leg of our institutions, right? Uh, ladies um, and gentlemen, we, we've had such a passionate conversation. Some questions. A terrific <laughs> panel. We always, though, have to stop on time here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hope the panelists might be able to stay, and if any of you would like to come up and ask some questions, uh, but at this point, I have to ask you to thank them for a remarkable <laughs> presentation.